we want to come out of our research. And since uh, we're working against the clock, I'm going to go on and make my opening statement and uh, while my staff tries to find out or to find our first witness. If we don't get the first witness, we'll go to the second panel. And I thank you for your patience. I want to welcome you to uh, this afternoon's hearing on the federal government's consolidated financial uh, statements for 2008 and the subcommittee's review of federal agencies' progress to date in modernizing their management systems and internal controls. And I welcome our distinguished witnesses and look forward to hearing all of your testimony. And um, as you know, we had this hearing scheduled for a previous date. We had to postpone that because of uh, conflicts. So I'm pleased to state that some progress has been made since last year. And for the second year running, GAO was able to offer unqualified opinions on the 2008 statement of social insurance. In 2008, a total of 21 out of 24 CFO Act agencies received unqualified opinions for an increase of one additional clean audit opinion over last year. This is the highest total reported in the last six years. Also, I'm happy to share that for the fourth year in a row, all major federal agencies satisfy the 45-day financial audit deadline as mandated by the stringent reporting guidelines established by the OMB. Across the government, the overall number of material weaknesses decreased from 39 to 32, or by 18 percent, mostly due to a decline in material weaknesses related to deficiencies in agency financial systems and security. The outstanding material weaknesses are linked to the deficiencies in financial management and reporting financial systems and security properly, plant and equipment, and budgetary reporting. Some of the changes needed to improve these areas are related to the financial preparation process, changes in information technology security, the receipt and the tracking of property, plant and equipment, and funds control. And the good news is, for the fifth consecutive year, there has been an almost 50% decrease in material weaknesses since the year 2001. However, throughout the federal government, agencies continue to demonstrate deficiencies that prevent the GAO from rendering an opinion on the U.S. government's consolidated financial statement. For the 12th year in a row, GAO was unable to render an opinion on the federal government's consolidated financial report statement, mostly due to material weaknesses in financial reporting. And this is an area where change must occur without delay. We recognize that the federal government has recently undertaken drastic steps to stabilize the nation's financial markets and the long-term effects of these actions in the midst of a recession are unknown, which is all the more reason why federal agencies must be more aggressive in streamlining their management systems and operations. Um, Mr. Dodaro um, and I will be interesting. Where is he? Oh, there he is, right, right in front of me. My grandmother said, uh, you say, if it was a snake, it would have bitten you. <laughs> I'll be interested in hearing your comments regarding the status of federal agencies' efforts to put in place effective management systems and internal controls in this time of limited resources, and how federal agencies can expedite their efforts to address weaknesses uh, related to financial reporting, systems management, and improper payments. I also look forward to hearing Mr. Gregg's comments uh, regarding the impact 
of the ongoing recession and last year's action by the federal government to stabilize the markets on our nation's future financial condition. In addition, we'll hear from Ms. Sherry and Mr. Spall regarding the changes their agencies are making to improve their protocols related to financial reporting and management systems. As we review the performance of our federal agencies today, we will also hear from uh, Congressman Henry Cuellar about the, le uh, the legislation he has sponsored, if we can find him, <laughs> H.R. 2142, the Government Efficiency, Effectiveness, and Performance Improvement Act of 2009. The intent of Mr. Cuellar's legislation is to build upon the Government Performance and Results Act of 1993 by requiring that ever, every federal program be assessed at least once every five years. The legislation also requires the Performance Improvement Council and agency improvement uh, officers to comply. And once again, I would uh, like to thank the panelists for joining us today, and we look forward to your testimony. And uh, members who come in, uh, we will, without objection, we'll have them um, put their statements on the records. And um, I will allow the minority member, the ranking member, to make an opening statement and uh, we hope that we get other members, and if so, they can make a, uh, well, a very short statement. But what I'm going to do is call up the second panel. Excuse me. Uh, is he on the phone? Okay. Mm -hmm. We're just going to go on. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask the uh, second panel to come up, and um, we'll start with Mr. Dodaro, and uh, then he will be followed, and you can sit in the order that you see your name tag. Okay. Now, it is the committee's policy that members be sworn in, and I would like the members uh, of the panel to now stand our minister the oath. Would you please raise your right hands? Okay. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Thank you. Let the record show that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. You're now seated. Um, Mr. Gene, okay, Comptroller General of the United States and the head of the Government Accountability Office, the investigative and auditing agency uh, for the Congress. And he has held such positions as Chief Operating Officer and the head of the GAO's Accounting and Information Management Division over the course of his distinguished career with the agency. And I ask that each of the witnesses now give a brief summary of their testimony and keep this summary uh, under five minutes if you can. Uh, your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. And um, let me go on and introduce Mr. Richard L. Craig, who has served at the Department of Treasury with distinction for 36 years. And prior to his retirement, Mr. Craig was the commissioner of the Financial Management Service for nine years, and before that, served as a commissioner of the Bureau of the Public Debt for 10 years. Mr. Craig has also held numerous other management positions at the Treasury Department during his long career. So let's start now with Mr. Dodardo, and please proceed. Good afternoon, Madam uh, Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today to discuss GEO's audit of the consolidated financial statements for the federal government for fiscal year 2008. 
Uh, as you pointed out in your opening statement, uh, this year uh, for 2008, like prior years, we were unable to give an opinion on the overall consolidated uh, financial statements on an accrual basis, uh, largely due to a wide range of uh, serious deficiencies, but two I would single out. One would be serious uh, and uh, long-standing problems at the Department of Defense, and secondly is the inability to reconcile uh, transactions that take place among federal government agencies. Uh, those have been problems from the very beginning uh, and remain problems today, although progress is being made. As you noted in your opening statement, 21 departments and agencies were able to get clean opinions this past year. That is clearly notable progress and we're pleased to see that. Uh, that compares to only six of the 24 agencies when the CFO Act implementation requirements were, were made government-wide back in 1996. So that's clear progress. Uh, the uh, issues that remain, however, are significant. The three that do not have uh, clean audit opinions are three of the largest uh, federal departments, DOD, the Department of uh, uh, Homeland Security, and uh, NASA. And so those efforts need to continue to work on their problems, make progress like the rest of the federal agencies ac across the government. Now, as you mentioned uh, last year, since we've prepared the uh, financial, our, our audit on Treasury's financial statements, there have been significant efforts made through the Economic Stabilization Act to create the Troubled Asset Relief Program and also the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Uh, both of those programs authorize huge sums of money, in one case $700 billion, in another case $787 billion. And so they bring new financial management challenges to the federal departments and agencies. Uh, and, and so those issues will have to be worked on this year. But they also bring uh, new requirements to Treasury to finance the government's operations. And if I would uh, direct your attention to the charts, I would like to show the impact that it's having on the federal government's uh, financial position. Uh, and actually, in, we're going to use the fir first one, please. Uh, the first one shows debt held by the public and how that's changed, uh, Madam Chairman, woman. Uh, the debt held by the public in fiscal year 2001 was $3.3 billion, or about 33% of the gross domestic product. Uh, by uh, fiscal year 2008, that had jumped to $5.8 uh, trillion and almost 41% of the gross domestic product. Uh, that's before uh, some of these uh, huge uh, new initiatives have been approved. Next year's projection is that the debt held by the public will go to $8.5 trillion or almost 60% of the gross domestic uh, product. Uh, and also, uh, the current debt ceiling for the federal government is $12.1 trillion. That's likely going to have to be raised again uh, this year to accommodate uh, financing these operations. The next chart shows what the future uh, could look like. Uh, the blue line projections is the CBO's uh, baseline extended, uh, which shows that we're headed to historical high levels. Uh, the largest uh, debt that we've ever had as a percent of gross domestic product occurred during World War II. Uh, and it, at that point, it was 109% of the, of the gross domestic product. Our projections show uh, that it could reach that level again as early as the, around uh, 2020, between 2020 and 2025, unless some action is taken. The last chart I'll show uh, gives you some idea of the magnitude of the gap that is occurring. And basically, the federal government's on an unsustainable long-term fiscal path. This shows right now in 2008 uh, were the revenue that is expected to be collected, which is represented by the line, is not enough to fund the entire federal uh, government's activities, and so we borrow the rest of the money. That borrowing is going to go up in 2019, uh, and by 2030, unless some action is taken, we would only have enough money to pay interest on the national debt, which is the blue bar at the bottom. The green bar is Social Security payments to individuals. The red bar is Medicare and Medicaid. We wouldn't even have enough money to pay that. And the orange is all the rest of the federal government, including the Department of Defense. So this is a very serious issue. Clearly, our government had to move 
to deal with stabilizing the banking system. Clearly, the government had to move to deal with the economic downturn, which is very serious. But that same level of intensity needs to be focused on a long-term plan to bring the federal government's financial uh, situation onto, on a more sustainable long-term path. That concludes my opening statements, Madam Chairman, woman, and I'd be happy to answer questions at the appropriate time. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Gregg, you can proceed. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Watson. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to discuss the financial report of the United States government uh, and the related audit by the Government Account Accountability Office. The financial report incorporated the consolidated government-wide financial statements is designed to report on the financial position and condition of the federal government following U.S. federal generally accepted accounting principles. Your interest in improving federal financial management is greatly appreciated. The financial report reflects the Treasury and OMB's long-standing responsibility to provide the Congress and the public with timely and reliable information on the cost of government's operations, the source of funds used to, to uh, fund them, and the implications of the government's financial responsibilities. The government's net operating cost for fiscal 2008 was just over $1 trillion, more than triple the net operating cost for the prior fiscal year. This increase resulted from government revenues that stayed relatively flat, while cost increased <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. The government's budget deficit for the fiscal year ended September 30, 2008, was $455 billion, which is more than double the deficit for the prior year. Appropriately, the financial report discusses the key fiscal challenges facing the federal government. At the end of fiscal 2008, the government had just begun, begun to initiate a number of unprecedented actions to deal with the economic downturn. As such, the financial report discusses the financial impact on the government's operations stemming from those steps and the, government, and the steps the government took to restore stability in the U.S. financial system. While these events had minimal impact on the fiscal 2008 statements, they will almost certainly play a more substantial role in fiscal 2009. Although, although the economy and market stabilization issues arose in 2008 and, of course, remain ongoing concerns, the longer-term issues of fiscal sustainability cannot be overlooked. Accordingly, the report also discusses the government's long-term fiscal challenges funding Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. For fiscal 2008, GEO was also unable, was again unable to express an opinion on most of the government-wide financial statements that appear in the financial report. The lone exception was a second consecutive unqualified or clean audit opinion on the statement of social insurance, which shows the estimated net present cost of the government's exposures of its social insurance programs, primarily Social Security and Medicare, over 75 years. The disclaimer on the remainder of the statement stems from three long-standing material weaknesses. First, serious financial management control issues at Department of Defense. Second, the government's inability to adequately account for and reconcile intergovernmental activity and balances between agencies. And third, the government's deficiencies in the process for preparing the consolidated financial statements. DOD continues to work towards resolution of many accounting issues, including those pertaining to property, inventory, accounts payable, and several other areas. DOD faces no small challenge in trying to integrate and modernize hundreds of financial systems but the department did show progress in fiscal 2008 as the Corps of Engineers obtained a clean opinion for the first time. The Treasury Department, working with OMB and other government agencies, has made considerable progress towards resolving the intergovernmental transactions and consolidation weaknesses. Intergovernmental transactions imbalances occur when two agencies conducting business with each other as trading partners record and report the same transaction differently. We continue to make progress on the third material weakness, the need to improve the process for preparing the, and the consolidated financial report. We've made significant strides in financial reports preparation and consolidation by developing 
short-term and long-term strategies. These include improving data collection, better disclosure requirements, and, and more information from, from the agencies on an ongoing basis. In all, Treasury and OMB's efforts to date have resulted in the reduction of GAO findings and recommendations by more than two-thirds from over 150 just a few years ago to just over 40 for the fiscal 2008 audit. During 2008, we continued to make significant progress leading to the closure of 16 of 56 recommendations that were outstanding from the previous audit reports. We have implemented major strategies to address these remaining 40 findings through contractor support, targeted task groups, and extensive engagement of the CFO and audit community. In fiscal 2009, we expect to resolve 14 of those remaining 40 findings. GEO identified only four new issues in the fiscal 2008 audit, all of which we anticipate will be resolved within the uh, in fiscal 2009. Decision makers not only need reliable information, but they also need timely information. While Treasury and other agencies continue to work towards systems and process solutions, they, need, they continue to meet ambitious deadlines. Agencies continue to meet the OMB accelerated reporting deadline of November 15th, just 45 days after the end of the fiscal year. While Treasury continues to successfully compile the government-wide report from the many agency reports just 30 days later. In addition, as you mentioned, 21 of 24 CFO agencies earn an unqualified opinion. A common critique of the financial report of the U.S. government is that despite the fact that it contains more than 180 pages of detailed information on the government's financial position and condition, it is not a practical document for communicating with American citizens or the Congress. In response, beginning in fiscal 2007, the Treasury Department and OMB, in cooperation with GEO, developed and issued a summary report entitled The Government's Financial Health a Citizen's Guide to the Financial Report of the United States Government. This guide, which is included in the financial report, provides a summary of the key data and issues addressed in the full report in a user-friendly manner to the public. Despite our recent accomplishments and progress, much work remains, and we will continue to work towards resolution of the government's reporting process weaknesses. However, these reports are limited or even minimal value if they go unread. As such, in addition to addressing, addressing process issues, we'll continue to seek ways to make the financial report and the information that it contains more relevant and useful to the general public. Thank you, Chairwoman Watson. That concludes my opening remarks. We certainly want to thank the two of you. Uh, I would like you to stay in place, and we're going to go back to panel one. We're going to submit the questions we had uh, to you, and you can respond in writing the interest of time. There's a little game playing going on on the floor. There are <laughs> motions to adjourn. So rather than run back and forth, uh, we're going to stay here and uh, at least hear your presentations. You can explain your bill, and then we will uh, ask for the answers, and well, the questions, and then the answers uh, through mail. And I'm sorry we can't share the responses with the audience, but uh, we are busy on the floor, as you can see. Mr. Coyar, please, stay in place. He can use the third mic. Madam Chair, thank you uh, very, very, very much for allowing me to be here with you. I want to join um, um, the uh, members that have uh, helped me out in this particular bill. Uh, I, one of the things I've always believed that federal government can do two things to become more efficient, more effective, and more accountable. Uh, that is, we can implement program assessment standards and we can use those standards to conduct legislative oversight. But in order to perform both tasks, we must have accurate financial information from our agencies, and that is a necessity. Uh, the piece of legislation that I have introduced is H.R. 2142, the Government Efficiency, Effectiveness, and Performance Improvement Act. Improving the performance of our agency is a bipartisan issue, which is a hallmark of good government. Also, adequate pro uh, program assessments will provide agencies with data that can help them in the formulation of accurate financial information. 
Uh, certainly, I want to thank uh, my uh, colleague, Dennis Moore, and uh, for his significant contributions to this legislation, as well as other members that have co-sponsored this legislation. I also want to thank uh, Bernice uh, Steinhardt from the uh, Government Accountability Office. Uh, uh, she and uh, her colleagues have written extensively on this uh, area, and I certainly uh, ask you all to take a look at, uh, at her work. Uh, what gets measured gets done, and this is the, the focus of this particular uh, focus that we have. It's basically looking at results-oriented uh, government, setting goals, performance targets for our agencies, and making sure that those measures uh, are become uh, uh, results that we're looking at. You know, there was a book that was written more than uh, 10 years ago, back in 1992, uh, David Osborne and Ted Gobbler, in a book that they, uh, they call Reinventing Government. Uh, there they talk about certain principles, and I think, Madam Chair, this is very important. Uh, they talk about what gets measured gets done. Uh, if you don't measure results, you can't tell success from failure. If you can't see success, you can't reward it. If you can't reward success, you're probably rewarding failure. Uh, if you can't recognize failure, you can't correct it. Uh, if you can demonstrate results, then you can win public uh, support. To summarize this, I would like to just give you a little bit show and tell and the rest of my testimonies here. Uh, I would ask you to look at bill patterns. Bill patterns for appropriations uh, are, have been transformed across the state. As you know, most, most states have done what we call results-oriented government. The federal government did a little bit in 1993 under President Clinton. Uh, but I'm using Texas as a pattern, just as an example. Would you see the bill pattern that a lot of states have gone to is what we call first the line item uh, pattern. What you see there is basically they say, you know, one item, you know, travel, this is how much they get, uh, how much they get for, uh, for uh, uh, you know, let's say services that they provide. And you can see it's a very simple way. You don't get much information. The next pattern, uh, that was in the 1970s, uh, you move into the 80s and moves more into what we call a program type of uh, bill pattern. Uh, you look at it, it sets up a little bit more of the programs instead of very detailed items. You can see a little, a little bit of evolution. Then you move into the modern, and I'm using Texas as an example. Uh, basically here what you would see is you have the amount of services, but you also have, if you keep going down on the... Uh, on the area, you see uh, areas that uh, you see goals there, you see outcomes, you see strategies, and you get uh, the efficiencies and how much it costs to do certain things, outputs. And when you look at this type of information, the financial information that's provided is put in a particular area, in a particular way that provides you more information and therefore provides better legislative, uh, legislative side because uh, Madam Chair, you will see there that you will have a goal for the agency. You will see what results you want to see. Instead of measuring activity, measure the results that you want to see. Finally, the last thing is, let me show you the, the, the next one. And basically, the next one is what the federal government looks like. If you look at the federal budget, this is what we have. And, it, and in many ways, it reminds me of what we were doing in the 1970s in a lot of states. You see there, it's basically, they'll say, this program gets X amount of dollars, this next program gets X amount of dollars, and it's basically what states were doing in the 1970s. And here we are already in the 21st century, and our federal government has not gone to measuring results, uh, measuring uh, the information that we need to look at, and we're still in the 1970s in many ways, or before that, at the federal government. I think this uh, committee, Madam Chair, has a great opportunity, as especially now when we're spending a lot of money, is to start looking at results instead of saying, here's uh, you know, $1 billion to do this. And if we look at this, and, and there's a lot more detail, but I think it's all in my testimony, and I think the show and tell is probably the best way to show where we are as the federal government and how we're probably light years behind what a lot of uh, states have gone to. Uh, and most of the states have moved into this performance uh, measures that we have. I know the GAO and other organizations have done a great job at talking about this. And, and Madam Chair, I, I present this in a short period of time because we've got to go both. But I would ask you to take a look at this uh, information and hopefully we can spend more time at a later time discussing this particular While concept. you're still seated there, let me just ask you, uh, you know, we've had hearings on the monies that we have sent into Iraq 
after mission was accomplished and uh, the plane loads flew. And we still can't account for $9 billion. Right. Uh, would this new format that you are laying out in your bill be able to tell us from the Department of Defense, the Pentagon, uh, how to trace this money and where possibly it would go? Looking for results. I don't know if we got results. R right, exactly. If you look at the bill pattern, the federal pattern, and, and I, now, I can give you... Is that page 27? Uh, that is, uh, that's, uh, well, that's part of, it's one of my attachments there. I just gave you an example. Yeah. You can put the military the same thing. Program military A, program military B, program military C, and the, the amounts of billions of dollars. If we would put it, go back to the, that one right here where you see the goals, you say, we're going to put you a billion, we're going to give you a billion dollars. From the billion dollars, we want you to meet this particular goal. And here are the measures that we want you to, uh, you know, the, to, to, to meet. And if you don't meet those measures, then if there's a variance, we want you to come back and tell us why. The problem is we've been giving monies in programs and not in setting the goals, the strategies, the outcomes that we want. Part of this is our problem, Madam Chair, as, as uh, members of, of Congress. We're not providing the, pri uh, the proper oversight with the tools that will provide us this information. And I believe that if you look at this, this is just an example. Imagine if we said, here's the money, billions of dollars that we're sending off to Iraq. And let's say you look at reconstruction. Here is the goal for reconstruction. Here is the percentage, uh, the, I mean, the uh, outcomes we want to see. Here is the strategy. Here is the outputs that we want to look at. Then that will provide us more, uh, more oversight uh, to this. Uh, again, Madam Chair, if you look at this, we're still stuck in a 1970s, pre-1970s format. And I believe this committee has, a, has the opportunity to change the way we do business uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in, in, in the federal government. We're still setting monies and programs. We're not going into, and here's the example. This is what we're doing. We're just saying program A, you get this amount of dollars. Sure, there's been some performance measures uh, that have been done in different programs, but they're not accessible in an easy way to members of Congress. And I guess the best thing I can summarize is if you look at my attachments, look at the 1970s, look at the 1980s bill patterns, look at the 2000s as an example, what Texas is doing, and you can use California or you can look, look at other states who are doing this, then look at what the federal government is doing and you will see that we're still stuck in the 1970s, pre-70s uh, format. I really want to thank you for the thought that you have put into your proposed legislation because our oversight uh, responsibility uh, has not been utilized to get the best results. We have to find out where our dollars are going, particularly during the time when we have such great deficits and our debt is growing every day. I ask you to look at the statement, Madam Chair, from David Osborne, and I think it summarized what gets measured gets done. If you don't measure results, you can't uh, tell success from failure, and if you can't see success, you probably uh, reward It's how failure. you lay out that measurement. That's correct. To get the kind of information you want, and I do thank you for your proposal in front of us. And uh, to the audience, we will go through it, and uh, we will have certain questions that we are, we're just running out of time. And, uh, but we will have certain questions we'll want to ask the witnesses and then they can uh, respond in writing and we'll have another hearing so that we can share the information that we get back with the general public. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, we're now going to turn to the third and final panel and again, I will have to ask you to stand and raise your right hand to be sworn in. And as they are coming up, and if you will continue to stand, uh, first is uh, Ms. Peggy Sherry, and she's the Acting Chief Financial Officer for the Department of Homeland Security. And Ms. Sherry previously served as the Deputy Deputy Chief Financial Officer for the United States Holocaust 
uh, Memorial Museum and as a uh, auditor for the Government Accountability Office and let me send you our condolences of, on the incident that happened within an area of your responsibility. And uh, Mr. Ronald Spall is the Chief Financial Officer for NASA and Mr. Spall has served as the Executive Vice President and Chief Financial uh, Officer and Director of uh, ICX Technologies and as Executive Vice President, Chief Financial Officer and Director of Mantech International Corporation and as Chairman and Founder of Alpine Partners. Um, Mr. Brian Riedel is a, a Senior Policy Analyst and Grover Herman Fellow in Federal Budgetary Affairs for the Thomas A. Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies at the Heritage Foundation. And his area of expertise includes federal spending, appropriations, economic growth, agriculture, and welfare reform. And while you're standing, okay, uh, the oath of office, and uh, do you solemnly swear to tell, right hand please, yeah. Do you solemnly swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right, you may be seated and let the record uh, reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. And, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I'd like to proceed uh, with uh, Ms. Sherry first and uh, the briefer you could be, the better. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairwoman Watson, Ranking Member Bill Bray, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify before you on the results of the Department of Homeland Security's fiscal year 2008 financial statement audit. I also thank you for enacting the DHS Financial Accountability Act. With the passage of this act, DHS launched an ambitious multi-year effort to build assurances for internal controls as well as executing corrective actions to improve financial accounting and reporting. DHS received a disclaimer of opinion on its fiscal year 2008 financial statements. However, for the third consecutive year, audit results show we continue to make steadfast progress. Auditors noted the department's progress in implementing corrective actions and improving the quality and reliability of our financial reporting. Our multi-year corrective action plans led to reducing the number of material weaknesses from 10 to 7 to 6 in the past three years. We also reduced the number of disclaimer conditions from 10 to 6 to 3 in the past three years. In addition, the Secretary's financial reporting assurance statement has improved from a statement of no assurance in fiscal year 05 to a statement that illustrates internal controls are well designed in fiscal year 08. For fiscal year 2009, the Department's goal is to provide our first ever assurance that internal controls are effectively working with the exception of those in a few components. Audit challenges do remain, but more in, in more focused areas. We are partnering with and providing oversight to the Coast Guard, the Transportation Security Administration, and FEMA to address audit disclaimer and material weakness conditions. We continue to demonstrate progress in performance reporting. I'm pleased that our 2008 performance report was recently ranked fourth highest in the federal government for providing useful information on the public benefits and outcomes DHS delivers. This is particularly noteworthy since two years ago, DHS was ranked 21 out of 24. We improved the link between resources and outcome-oriented performance goals and described our improvement strategies when goals were not met. We continue to implement initiatives aimed at increasing financial management competencies and sustaining financial management improvements throughout the department. For instance, in the fall, we released the DHS Financial Management Policy Manual. This online manual provides guidance on budget formulation, execution, financial management, accounting, and reporting while introducing standardization throughout DHS with a strong focus on internal controls. Also, we issued the third edition of the Internal Control Playbook, which outlines the department's strategy and process to eliminate internal control weaknesses and build strong management assurances. 
The most important part of building our core financial management competencies is strengthening and training our workforce. We are in our fourth series of the CFO Mentorship Program for mid-level managers to help create a pipeline of strong candidates for senior financial management leadership roles at DHS. Additionally, nearly 400 newly hired employees from across the country have attended common financial management training. They learn about the different missions within the department, our core financial functions, and key financial fi um, uh, management fundamentals. I also sponsor a recurring certification program to professionalize the DHS workforce. As we make improvements in our financial reporting and strengthen the skills of our workforce, we continue moving forward to consolidate our financial systems. This initiative will greatly improve the quality of and control over DHS financial data, making financial ac accounting processes more efficient and serve as the foundation for standard business and financial management practices across the department. Financial management has come a long way at DHS and I'm inspired by the extraordinary efforts of our dedicated staff at headquarters and in the components. We remain committed to improving financial management, continuing our efforts to strengthen internal controls and to realigning business processes for improved effectiveness and efficiency in support of our mission and the American taxpayer. I appreciate the support we have re received from the OIG, the GAO, this committee, and Congress. Thank you for your leadership and your continued support of the Department of Homeland Security. Thank you. We will now proceed with Mrs. Spall. Thank you. Chairwoman, Chairwoman Watson, Ranking Member Grillbray, and members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to be here this afternoon to discuss NASA's financial management and reporting and the seriousness with which NASA takes reporting its financial and operation perfor operational performance to the President to the Congress, and to the citizens of the United States. On an annual basis, NASA prepares a full set of financial statements that are independently audited with three audit reports on financial statements, internal controls, and legal compliance. Since fiscal year 2003, though, NASA has received a disclaimer of opinion from its auditors. While the auditors' reports for fiscal year 2008 complemented NASA on its recent progress, as with prior years, they also noted NASA's continued inability to provide sufficient evidential support for the amounts presented in some accounts in the financial statements and cited two internal control material weaknesses, as well as certain non-compliance with regulatory requirements for accounting and for financial systems. In order to address the underlying problems preventing NASA from regularly obtaining an unqualified audit opinion on its financial statements, the agency took an entirely new, holistic approach in the fiscal year 2008 for resolving weaknesses and improving the fidelity of its financial data, as well as expanding the usefulness of reported financial information to drive enhanced financial and operational performance. With respect to the preparation of its accounts and financial statements, this change in approach began with developing and implementing a new global financial management strategy, a comprehensive compliance strategy, CCAS, that focuses on assuring full compliance with generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP, and other financial reporting requirements across the agency. This approach begins with identifying the requirements for meeting all applicable accounting and regulatory standards for each financial statement line item, including audit, audit evidence for each such account and the associated internal controls needed, while also addressing overarching financial reporting process and related IT system requirements. To assure CCAS remains current, it's updated on a continuous basis with all applicable governing regulations and accounting standards. To support effective CCAS implementation and operation, NASA has also developed and implemented a continuous monitoring program, CMP, which provides the overall management controls framework and detailed processes designed to drive agency compliance with CCAS. CMP performance certifications from, in, from the individuals responsible are also required on a monthly basis, backed by a rigorous quality control process, documented, documenting that each and every control activity has been performed at each of NASA's centers monthly. Since NASA implemented CCAS and CMP midway through last year, a significant decline in the number and dollar value of exception reports and a clear path forward to full compliance have been demonstrated. With these approaches providing validated performance for its financial statement processes and for adherence to GAAP, 
NASA should be able to demonstrate the effectiveness of the management and internal controls, allowing the agency to eliminate the first of its two internal control weaknesses for financial systems, analysis, and oversight. There are, however, key challenges remaining for obtaining an unqualified opinion. In particular, NASA's audit reports have, for many years, noted two critical issues with respect to the reporting of legacy property plant equipment, PP&E. For the first, first, with the sufficiency of evidential support for the PP&E balances reported, and secondly, with the internal controls for property accounting. To remediate the property accounting, NASA's already implemented new property accounting policies and procedures and, in, and incorporated a new integrated asset management module, module within its financial management system, taking care of those issues. However, with respect to legacy PP&E assets, whose acquisition began before the CFO Act of 1990 and before the mandated use of GAAP accounting by the government, NASA does not have the necessary supporting information available to provide auditable book values under current accounting standards, including, for example, NASA's legacy shuttle and space station related assets comprising the overwhelming portion of PP&E net asset value, about 19. With a space station depreciation, with, while the space station depreciation schedule brings the net asset value down to an immaterial level and naturally leads to NASA's presently issue. The agency's made considerable progress in the last year as it's established the foundation for financial management excellence with its comprehensive compliance strategy, continuous monitoring program, and expanded financial reporting capabilities, along with improvements and consolidations to its financial management and operations. This year, the agency is focused on and is committed to rigorous execution using this foundation, improving effective operation of its financial systems and processes, moving closer to achieving auditability of its financial statements, and driving even better financial performance across the agency's operations and project, projects. Madam Chairwoman, thank you again. And I, plea, I would be pleased to respond to any questions you or the other members of the subcommittee may have. Thank you so much. And let's now proceed to you, Mr. Reed. Is it Riedel? Riedel. Riedel. Uh, Chair Chairwoman Watson, Ranking Member of Bailbray, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brian Riedel. I am the Grover Herman Fellow in Federal Budgetary Affairs of the Heritage Foundation. The views I express here are my own and should not be construed as representing any official position of the Heritage Foundation. The most striking part of the 2008 financial report of the United States government is not the balance sheets showing assets of $2 trillion dwarfed by liabilities of $12 trillion, Rather, it is the statements of social insurance, which show $43 trillion in excess future expenditures over future revenues for Social Security and Medicare. Indeed, the statement of the Comptroller General notes the need for the nation's leaders to, quote, turn their attention to the long-term challenges of addressing the federal government's large and growing structural deficits, end quote. And he also warns that, quote, the federal government is on an unsustainable long-term fiscal path, end quote. As a member of the bipartisan fiscal wake-up tour that consists of representatives of the Concord Coalition, Heritage Foundation, and Brookings Institution, as well as former United States Comptroller General David Walker, I have spoken to thousands of Americans at public town hall meetings from coast to coast on the need to reform these entitlements. And I'd like to share with you what I have shared with these audiences. First, in the short term, uh, President Obama has offered a budget that would increase federal spending to a peacetime record of 24.5% of GDP by 2019, and that's not even counting the health care plan. Because tax revenues will not keep up with the spending growth, the President's budget would add $9 trillion in new debt over the next decade. It would double the national debt to 82% of GDP. By steeply increasing spending and digging the nation deeper into debt, the nation would have less financial flexibility and fewer resources to deal with that $43 trillion shortfall that Social Security and Medicare face. The basic entitlement challenge is as follows. The first of 77 million baby boomers have already begun retiring. Combined with longer lifespans, these retirements drive down the ratio of workers supporting each retiree. In 1960, five workers pay the benefits of each retiree. Today, three workers pay the benefits of each retiree, 
And by 2030, that ratio will be 2 to 1. Now, what does a 2 to 1 worker to retiree ratio really mean? Imagine a boy and a girl born today in 2009. In 2030, they get married and start their own family. This young couple just starting out will have to support themselves, their children, and the Social Security and Medicare benefits of their very own retiree. Every married couple will have that burden. The costs will be enormous, especially given the steep rise in health care costs that plagues Medicare. And don't forget, the baby boomers' long-term care expenses will raise Medicaid costs up as well. Overall, the combined cost of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid is projected to rise by 10% of GDP, from 8.4% of GDP to 18.4% of GDP by 2050. There's really not a lot of options here. The first option is to raise taxes. But if you raise taxes to close that 10% of GDP gap, that would be the equivalent today of raising taxes by $12,000 per household. That's what 10% of GDP would feel like. According to the Congressional Budget Office, the middle class would be pushed into a 63% income tax bracket and the wealthy into an 88% income tax bracket. And even that assumes that health care costs slow down. Even allowing the 2001 and 2003 tax cuts to expire, even including all of those for the middle class or for, for lower income individuals, would close just one tenth of the long term gap. Okay, so a second option would be to finance these entitlements by cutting other programs. Surely there's a lot of waste in the federal budget to eliminate. But in order to make room for the big three entitlements, every program but defense would have to be eliminated by 2030. And by 2049, defense would have to be eliminated too. At that point, 100% of the federal budget would have to go to Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and net interest. The third option, simply running budget deficits, is no better. Borrowing an additional 10% of GDP would be like today borrowing an additional $1.4 trillion every year. That would drive national debt to levels unseen in history and create a vicious circle of rising interest rates and debt, resulting in economic collapse. The only real option is to reform Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. An entitlement reform commission, such as the SAFE Commission, by, proposed by Congressmen Jim Cooper and Frank Wolf, could design sustainable entitlement reforms and allow Congress to vote up or down on that package. Now, some have asked, why Congress should worry about the long-term problems now? Well, the big three entitlements already consume 42% of all federal spending. But more importantly, every year of delay raises the final reform cost by a trillion dollars. Additionally, some people have said that anyone over age 55 should be exempt from entitlement reforms. But every year, 4 million baby boomers cross that threshold, and, and by 2019, all baby boomers will be 55. So at that point, your only choice would be to pull the rug out from those uh, over age 55. Nor does the Social Security Trust Fund reduce these long-term obligations either. Yes, the Social Security Trust Fund likely guarantees that benefits will be paid through 2037. But without any actual economic assets in the trust fund, the painful tax increases and spending cuts I've described will need to begin in 2016 when the Social Security program falls into deficit. The trust fund does not reduce the future burden on taxpayers by a nickel. In conclusion, the challenge of financing retirement benefits is perhaps the greatest economic challenge of our era. Unless lawmakers promptly reform Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, America faces a future of soaring taxes and government spending that will cause poor economic performance and lower living standards. The longer lawmakers wait to enact these reforms, the more painful they will be. Thank you. I want to thank uh, all of the witnesses. And uh, Mr. Edel, uh, when we propose our questions to you, I would like not only responses to those questions, but recommendations. If we have to reform the entitlement programs, the top three, mm -hmm. where does that leave the safety net for society? So I'd like you to let us know what in your investigation research, uh, let us know what you would recommend. That's a great question, and I'll be happy to answer okay. it. OK. And I'd like to call on Mr. Bilbring, our ranking member, yeah, and let me just say, as a former mayor and county chairman, 
Let's also f not forget about the fact that the federal government thinks of ourselves in isolation, but then you have the other brand, the, the other separation or sec segments of the frontline service, which are the, the counties, the cities, and the states, um, and the impact there, because we're not, you're looking at just the resources of 40% of the federal government, but when we get into this crisis, it's a very real possibility that we want to make a priority decision and basically say that the federal government needs to absorb all of the government funds that are generated in this country and supersede local and community funding. And does the American people want to see now all funding and power centralized in the federal um, system and literally bleed the local and, and community systems dry of any money? Because there's only so much capital in there and we have totally ignore the fact of the eventual impact on on the, the local communities mm -hmm. and, and decide, uh, is Medicare more important than having sewer service? Is, um, and, you know, is Social Security more important than having a firefighter? And those are legitimate arguments that we forget about, that the great separations of power in this country are not between the three branches of the federal government, but actually between the city, county, and state, and the feds. And those other segments are going to be impacted somewhere down the line on our revenue source that we could tap into, but at what cost? Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you so much, and I thank the audiences for being here with us and for your patience, and I will now declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you.